Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we're going to be explaining how the tiny engines used in Formula One are capable of producing 1,000 horsepower. Now, the current generation of Formula One engines started in 2014. As a general overview, you have air come in through the intake, pass through the compressor side of the turbocharger. Of course, that heats up that air, so it then passes through an intercooler. This can be an air-to-air -air or an air-to-water intercooler. That cooled air then passes into the cylinders where it's used for combustion. The exhaust, of course, exits, helps spool up your turbocharger, and then goes out the exhaust at the back of the vehicle. So the special Specifications are set in that this must be a 1.6 liter 90 degree V6 engine and your bore is set at 80 millimeters which essentially means your stroke is set at 53 millimeters giving you a per cylinder size of 0.267 liters. So this is about half the size of the cylinders used in today's production cars, which tend to sit at about half a liter for their cylinder size. This engine revs up to 15,000 RPM. That is the limit, though realistically, you'll rarely ever see drivers shifting anywhere near this. We'll get into why later on in the video. So we have two clever additions to this Formula One power unit. They're both electric motors, uh, one of which is called an MGUK, uh, which is directly linked to the vehicle's crankshaft, and one of which is called an MGUH, which is directly linked to the turbocharger shaft. And so as you can imagine, if you have a turbocharged engine, as you start to create more exhaust gases, you start to produce more boost, which means you create more exhaust gases, which means you create more boost, and that just runs away, right? You have to have a solution to this. So in traditional turbocharged engines, we use waste gates so we can allow some of that exhaust pressure to bypass the turbo and thus not have this endless feedback loop where we continuously build boost. Now you can use waste gates in Formula One, but there's a more clever solution in order to harness as much energy as possible instead of wasting that energy going out the exhaust. So instead of wasting that energy, you can use that energy to spin up this MGUH, this electric motor which is connected to that exhaust portion of the turbocharger as well as the intake and so as you spin this motor up it can act like a brake it's essentially like regen uh, from your turbocharger so you're using this to break that force uh, that's trying to spool this up further and keep it at a certain level of boost and then that energy that this harnesses can then be sent to a battery or to the MGUK so your MGUH essentially serves three purposes you can use it to keep your turbocharger spooled up up when you're off throttle, basically acting like anti-lag. You can use it to charge the battery. There it's basically acting like a wastegate and limiting how much boost you can create uh, and that's harnessing that energy and sending it to a battery so you can use that energy later. And then you can use it to directly power the MGUK. So sending its power to the MGUK, which is directly linked to the crankshaft in order to get more acceleration at the wheels. Now your MGUK has two basic functions. First of all, it can be used to send 120 kilowatts of power directly to your crankshaft, so giving you greater acceleration, or you can use it uh, to use basically like brakes. It can be used for regen, so negative 120 kilowatts, or uh, in other words, you're using the regen to send 120 kilowatts of power from the MGUK back to the battery to save that energy for later use. So if our MGUK is making 120 kilowatts or about 160 horsepower, that means in order to get to 1,000 horsepower for the overall unit, we've got about 850 horsepower coming from the engine alone. But how is this actually possible? So as far as powertrains are concerned, there's basically two rules that run the show in Formula One. The first is you have a total limit of 110 kilograms of fuel that you can have stored on your vehicle. So this is how much energy you have in order to complete the race. So you have to complete a set number of laps, whoever does it in the least amount of time, that's basically your goal, and you're given 110 kilograms of fuel in order to do it. So the more energy you have, the faster you can complete this task, but everyone has the same amount of energy. 110 kilograms of fuel. Now, as far as the second rule, that comes down to fuel flow. So there is a cap on how much fuel you can have going into your engine, uh, which is dictated by this equation here. Fuel flow is equal to RPM times 0.009 plus 5.5, with a limit of 100 kilograms per hour. So you can never have more than 100 kilograms per hour of fuel going into your engine. So what does this equation 
equation look like when you plot it out? Well, basically it's a linear function and it caps out at 10,500 RPM. So at 10,500 RPM, you're allowed to use this maximum fuel flow of 100 kilograms per hour. This is why you don't see engines running up to 15,000 RPM. There's really no reason to do it. So if you were to plot out power uh, using this fuel map, you can't use more fuel above 10,500 RPM. You're limited, right? So why would you go to a higher RPM? Because you're just gonna have more frictional losses. Yes, you can get more air into the engine, but you can't put any more fuel into the engine. So there's no real reason to do it. So you'll see drivers shift at say, you know, 12,000 RPM. They're gonna wanna keep it within the peak of the power range, uh, which is gonna be, you know, peak power is going to be somewhere around like 10,500 to 11,000 RPM where you achieve that peak and then you want to use your gears to keep you within that as you go through the race. Okay, so we still don't understand how we're able to achieve a thousand horsepower. So what do we know? Well, we know that our power is ultimately limited by fuel. We can never exceed 100 kilograms of fuel per hour. So how much energy is in 100 kilograms of fuel? Well, we know from teams, uh, they state that the fuel used in Formula One is 99% the same as the pump gas that we're already used to. So the EPA states that one gallon of gas is equivalent to 33.7 kilowatt hours. One gallon of gas weighs about six pounds or 2.72 kilograms. So we can take 100 kilograms, which is our limit, divide that by 2.72, and that means we have about 36 0.8 total gallons of gas. And if we use our EPA conversion rate, we multiply that by 33.7 kilowatt hours. That means the total energy we have within 100 kilograms of gasoline is 1,240 kilowatt hours. Now, that's just some napkin math. Why should you believe me, right? Well, I found a Mercedes document which states in 100 kilograms of fuel, the total energy content is 1,240 kilowatt hours. Now, they actually state kilowatts, which is a unit of power, not energy. But again, keep in mind, this is a mid-pack team. Let's cut them a little slack. I'm kidding, chill out. Okay, so we know that our engines are limited in power by fuel, which is limited to 1,240 kilowatt hours per hour. In other words, our engine has a limit of 1240 kilowatts. Now that would be if we were operating at 100% thermal efficiency. We know these engines can exceed 50% thermal efficiency. So dividing that number by two, meaning our engines can create 620 kilowatts or about 830 horsepower plus 120 kilowatts from our MGUK, giving us a grand total of about 740 kilowatts. In other words, about 1000 thousand horsepower. Now, naturally, your next question might be, well, how in the world are they achieving 50% thermal efficiencies? It's impressive for today's internal combustion engines to reach 35% thermal efficiency. So how are these so much further uh, in efficiency? Well, there's three pieces of technology that I want to discuss. The first one being pre-chamber ignition. So if you think about today's combustion engines, when they're making maximum power, when you floor it in your car and it's making maximum power, it might be using an air fuel ratio of about 11 to 12 to 1. This means it's running rich. In other words, there's more fuel injected into the combustion chamber than you can possibly burn. This is ideal for making maximum power, but if we're thinking about Formula One, where we're limited on our fuel flow and we're limited on how much fuel we have, well then it's really dumb to use a rich mixture because it means some of that fuel isn't going to be used. We want to use it as efficiently as possible. So how can you run a leaner air fuel mixture in your engine? Well, that's what pre-chamber ignition helps achieve. So you basically have two combustion chambers, a really small one next to your spark plug and the larger one, the one we already know with our piston cylinder devices. So what happens is with Formula One, you're allowed one injector per cylinder. So this is a passive chamber. You have direct injection. That direct injector is very close to our little pre-chamber right here. And so you have a richer air fuel mixture next to that spark plug plug thanks to the timing of your direct injection than the rest of the cylinder. So the rest of the cylinder is going to be a bit more lean. So this rich pocket right next to the spark plug is going to start to combust. It'll create these little turbulent jets that expand out very quickly and help to combust that leaner air fuel mixture. 
Now, a company, Mali, uh, which creates turbulent jet ignition engines, says with a passive system like this, you can get away with high loads uh, with a, a air fuel ratio of 14.7 to 1 with an active system, meaning you were actually to have another fuel injector within this tiny little pre-chamber. Well, then you could achieve uh, air fuel ratios of about 30 to 1, lambda 2. So this, of course, is a passive system in Formula 1, but it means you can use leaner air fuel ratios than we're used to in our combustion vehicles. Okay, the second part of efficiency for F1 engines, within the rules it is stated that you are limited to a geometric compression ratio of 18 to 1. Now, we don't have production gasoline road cars using 18 to 1 uh, compression ratios. It would be very efficient, the higher your compression ratio, the greater your efficiency, but what happens when you start to get in these really high compression ratios? Well, you run into knock and it destroys your engine. But, you can have some clever tricks if this is your limit. So I don't know what they actually do in Formula One. I don't know what the compression ratios teams are using are, but here's just an example of what you can do with something like an 18 to 1 geometric compression ratio. So you have your intake stroke occur, you close your intake valves early. That means once your intake valves are closed, your piston continues to move down, so your compression stroke is actually limited by when that intake valve closed. So it's not that high. Let's say it's 15 to 1. So you compress all of that mixture, then you have combustion occur, your cylinder, your piston starts to come back down, reaches its initial uh, compression ratio meaning 15 to 1. In this case, we're talking about our expansion ratio, but we have further distance that we can travel. We still have pressure within that cylinder, and so we give it a little bit more distance that that piston can travel, and thus we can extract more energy out of that exhaust. So that is a more efficient way of operating. Now, it is worth mentioning that within Formula One, there is no variable valve timing, there is no variable valve lift. So whatever you choose to do, it is set. So you're typically gonna probably choose an RPM, 10,500 RPM, 11,000 RPM, something like that, to have your most efficient operating point as far as the design for the engine of making power. Uh, and so your fixed, your valve timing is going to be fixed. This is kind of where you get into those like discussions where people say, oh, like, Formula One is the most brilliant technology that's ever been invented. It's like all engineering is very cool based on its rule set, right? Like production cars have a completely different set of rules than Formula One cars. Both of them have ingenious engineering included within them, uh, so comparing them and saying one is better than the other, that's a bit silly. Like, if you could use variable valve timing, variable valve lift, things like active uh, chambers, it's like these are technologies that exist and are better than what's done in Formula One. They're not allowed to do it based on their rules. Okay, so finally we get to the third part of this efficiency discussion, which is our MGUH. So there is still some exhaust gas pressure remaining, of course, within that cylinder once combustion has finished. That exhaust is used to spool up this turbocharger and it's also used to put energy back into the battery using that MGUH. So using the MGUH, you're able to harness some of that energy that would otherwise be wasted uh, with this style of combustion engine. Now, I wanted to find a bit more concrete evidence for efficiency claims discussed in Formula One. And so I came across a study on lean pre-chamber gasoline engines, which just so happened to be co-authored by a former 15-year Renault Formula One engineer who, according to his LinkedIn, was responsible for hybrid engine specifications, both ICE and MGU, and responsible for 3D CFD engine simulations, injection, mixture preparation, combustion, knock. In this study, it stated 47% peak thermal efficiency achieved at lambda equals 2.1, with the gasoline-fed pre-chamber and indicated thermal efficiencies above 48% can be expected with a realistic electrified turbocharging system. Hmm, what does that sound like? So they're expecting close to 50% thermal efficiency using pre-chamber ignition as well as electrified turbocharger systems. Now, something I've always wondered is we've got these tiny engines, just 1.6 liters, and they're making about 850 horsepower. So how much boost are these turbochargers actually providing? And I've not been able to find a legitimate source that states, you know, what this boost level is. So let's try to calculate it. So we know that our fuel flow is 100 kilograms per hour. 
What is our airflow? Well, let's just start off assuming a naturally aspirated engine with 100% volumetric efficiency. In other words, we have our 1.6 liter engine. It's revving at 10,500 RPM. We're gonna multiply those together. That's gonna give us the total amount of airflow going through it. Divide that by two because we only have one intake stroke per two RPM. And that means going through our engine, we have 8,400 liters per minute. Because the metric system is beautiful, that means we have 8.4 meters cubed per minute. Now, we can multiply that by air density at sea level. So if we were at sea level, the amount of air going through the engine at 10,500 RPM with a naturally aspirated engine would be 10.29 kilograms per minute. Now, we know our fuel flow is 100 kilograms per hour, so let's get our airflow in terms of kilograms per hour. Simply multiply this by 60, and we get 617.4 kilograms per hour. Okay, so our air fuel ratio is our airflow divided by our fuel flow. So we have 617.4 divided by 100. That gives us an air fuel ratio of 6.17. Now this is extremely rich, right? We're injecting way too much fuel or we need to inject a lot more air using boost, using our turbochargers. So ideally our air fuel ratio would be 14.7 to one. That's the ideal stoichiometric air fuel ratio. So if we take 14.7, divide it by 6.17, that gives us the amount of air which we would need to have an ideal ratio, which would be 2.38 atmospheres. In other words, our absolute pressure would be about 35 PSI or 2.1. 4 bar, meaning our boost pressure subtracting our atmospheric pressure would be 20.3 or 1.4 bar. So a boost pressure for this 1.6 liter engine making 850 horsepower is only 20 PSI? That seems incredibly low. Uh, so the, kind of the reality check on why this number is so low, and I do think it's probably lower than I expect, Two reasons. First of all, it's a high revving engine. The higher you rev, the more power you can make per liter. But again, you're limited by that fuel flow, right? So the other huge part of it is that it is so efficient. So, you know, you may have a modern turbocharged engine running really high boost in order to make significantly less power than this, but it's operating at such a low efficiency. So because it's so efficient and because it's really efficient at a really high RPM, it's able to achieve a really high power number using a low amount of boost on a relative scale. Now, we don't actually know what the pressure is within these engines because we don't actually know what the air-fuel ratio is. Maybe they're able to get closer uh, to, say, a Lambda 2. I don't think they're going to go that high, but let's just say, for example, they were able to use an air-fuel ratio of 1.5 what is ideal. 1.5 times what is ideal, meaning a very lean air-fuel ratio, about 22 to 1. So, we take our 22 divided by 6.17, we get 3.57 atmospheres. In other words, our boost pressure here in this case would be 38 PSI or 2.6 bar, quite high. And the reason being is because you're running really lean. And so to run really lean, you inject a lot more air within that cylinder uh, than you actually need so that you can run the engine in a way which you have found to be the most efficient. Now, one final comment on what this boost pressure might be. Again, I don't know what it is, but my best guess would be between these numbers right here based on what air fuel ratio it's using. But what one thing you need to keep in mind is this is going to change depending on the circuit. So if you're at a really high elevation circuit like Mexico City, well, then you're going to have a higher boost pressure because the air is thinner. So you're going to use the turbocharger to compensate for that, to compensate for that low atmospheric pressure base that you're starting at. So hopefully you've learned something here about Formula One engines. Thank you so much for watching. And now I would recommend using the comments section to explain why the team that you're rooting for is so much better than everyone else. And also congratulations to Max. Max Verstappen on winning the 2023 Formula One Championship.